Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Monday. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to goodranchers.com slash Allie. That's goodranchers.com slash Allie. All right, guys, today we are talking to Coach Kennedy. You may have heard his story before. He is the coach from Washington State that prayed before football games and then was sued for it. And now for the past seven years, he has been in court battles over this. And his case is before the Supreme Court today. You can listen to oral arguments online and really they're deciding, can you prey on the property of public schools. And I'm kind of like rolling my eyes as I'm saying this because it's kind of insane that we are even having that debate. But today we're going to hear his story and we are going to hear from his lawyer as well, like what the arguments are and why this matters for all of us. Before we get into any of that, I would just ask, I like to ask every now and then, if you guys love this podcast, if you could please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, that would mean a lot. Also, we've got amazing We've got some amazing t-shirts that just came out last week. We've got a Raise a Respectful Ruckus t-shirt. And we also have a Politics Matter Because Policy Matters Because People Matter t-shirt in lots of different colors. We'll link it in the description of this episode so you can click on that and check that out. Plus, if you use my code ALLY10, you get 10% off. So it's great for you. Great gift. Also, guys, if you're listening or watching, it is a great Mother's Day gift. A lot of people commented on my Instagram post saying that this would that they want this for Mother's Day. So pay attention, pay attention. But we've got other stuff coming out too. And so, yeah, I'm really excited. You guys have been asking for merch. And so we finally got it. Check that out if you haven't already. All right, let me give you some context about this whole Coach Kennedy case. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of people on the left think that he should not have the right to pray um, without any coercion of the students or any kind of like official backing of his public school. He should not be able to pray at football games. And Slate, of course, ran this very negative article about him claiming a bunch of things that just aren't true. So I just kind of want to give you a taste of what's being said and what I think is the very unfair coverage surrounding this. And it kind of helps us understand really what moment that we're in when we're talking about this. So Slate claims that Coach Kennedy led explicitly religious prayer circles with students at the 50-yard line after the games. But the truth is that Kennedy started praying alone. As we will hear today, he did not stop students who wanted to join him, but he actually didn't ask them to. That was not a program that he started. Slate also claims that the school district repeatedly sought to accommodate his beliefs, asking him to pray in a less public location to avoid conveying the school's endorsement of his beliefs. But the reality is, is that the school district advised Kennedy that his motivational speeches must remain entirely secular in nature and that any religious activity must be physically separate from any student activity and students may not be allowed to join um, such activity, which, again, he did his best to accommodate at every level. Of course, Slate claims that he refused, um, but actually he temporarily stopped praying to accommodate this re- request, but he convicted to pray by himself after the games as he felt that God directed him to do, and so he did. Um, Slate also claims that he fired or he hired far right First Liberty Institutes uh, to threaten the school with a lawsuit. That is also not true. One, you can just bet if people on the left say far right, what they just mean is that like to the right of Bernie Sanders, they're not far right. They are constitutional lawyers that care about our freedoms and thank goodness for people like First Liberty. The truth is, is that uh, Coach Kennedy hired the lawyers after initially complying with the school's request. And by the way, he's just trying to uphold his constitutional rights. That's not threatening the school it's not attacking the school of course as the left often does they try to make it into like a republicans pounce situation and they try to say that the left is being victimized when in reality they're not um then he says that the slate says that he and his lawyers launched a media blitz falsely claiming that he had been persecuted for a quiet private prayer but in actuality that's true it's not a social media blitz they're just trying to raise awareness about what was happening because as you will hear he was also um he had to quit his job because of this he had to be removed from this uh position and of course slate exaggerates saying that that his prayers had become this like great spectacle that he was trying to draw attention but as you will hear for him today, um, from him today, that is not what was happening. He had a brief, silent prayer 
This is silent prayers that we're talking about. And then 20 players um, in October of, I believe it was 2015, from the other team um, knelt by him and also prayed. So they're voluntarily doing this. This is not a program of the school. He's not coercing. He's not asking uh, anyone to anyone to do this with him. And for that, he has been in a legal battle since 2015. And so this is troubling. The question is, like, do you have to check all of your sincerely held beliefs at the door when you enter into the public square? And if so, why? Secularists don't do that. Secular progressivism is not a neutral worldview, and they certainly bring in their worldview and their beliefs about gender and morality and God and sexuality and truth in America into every sphere that they occupy. And they try to um, dominate institutions and curriculum and corporate policy with their particular worldview, which is very religious in nature. So why is it that conservative Christians have to not only be relegated to private prayer, but not even that, that they actually have to bow down to secular progressivism in the public square rather than representing their beliefs in a way that is not coercive, um, but in a way that is simply genuine and obedient? Why is that there that uh, in an unfair standard. I have confidence um, that the Supreme Court is going to rule justly here. I think that we can all hope that that is the case and pray that that is the case. We believe in this kind of religious liberty for people of all backgrounds. Um, but of course, there are some unfair, unfair allegations and reporting when it comes to this case. He has been very, I think, unfairly maligned in the media because of this. Okay, before we get into this conversation, let me tell you, about our first sponsor for the day, and that is Naturally It's Clean. So all of you moms out there, you really care about the things that you bring into your home. We want things to be as safe as possible, especially the chemicals that we use to clean our homes. We want it to be as least toxic um, as they possibly can be. And that is why I love and use Naturally It's Clean. It's a home cleaning company dedicated to providing the most effective cleaning products for your home while reducing the use of harmful chemicals. Here's their secret. They use powerful plant-based enzymes, nature's solution to cleaning. And when I say powerful, I'm talking about hospital grade enzyme cleaning power. I'm not talking about like the the breath of a dandelion here that it seems like a lot of so-called cleaning products are, and they say that they're natural, but the problem is that they're not actually effective. That's not true with Naturally It's Clean. They're highly effective, but they use safer chemistry formulas to clean every area of your home from the bathroom to your hardwood floors to your kitchen. All of their products are manufactured right here in the U.S. That's important to me. And they offer free two-day shipping direct to your door. Try these amazing products for yourself. Right now, my listeners can get their hands on the Naturally It's Clean Alley's Essential Starter Kit stocked with four great products for 15% off. Simply visit naturallyitsclean.com slash alley. Use promo code alley. That's right. Try out these incredible cleaning products in your home today for 15% off by visiting naturallyitsclean.com slash alley. Code alley. That's naturallyitsclean.com slash Allie. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, you said a few minutes ago that you guys have done like 40 interviews together. Is that right? Yeah. So y'all yeah. are like a married couple finishing each other's <laughs> sentences, that kind of thing. <laughs> I can tell the dynamic works. And so I'm excited to talk to both of you. I'll talk to you about the story. I know because you guys have done so many interviews, a lot of people are familiar with the story. But there's a lot of people who aren't. There's a lot of people who don't know your story, don't know what's been going on for the past several years. And so I just want to get that story once again. And this is a faith-based podcast. This is a Christian podcast. And so we want to hear about your faith and how the Lord has sustained you through what I imagine is a pretty big trial in your life. Yes. So let's go back. Let's go back to 2015, or if we even want to go back to 2008, when you were originally hired, we can. How did all of this start? Why are you guys doing interviews together? Why do people even know your name? I would have to say we would want to start about 2008 okay. and when I was offered the job as a high school football coach in Bremerton, Washington, and it was really by a fluke and God kind of showed up and gave me a calling. I had no idea. I just uh, retired from the Marine Corps and I was out on a run and the, what was he, the athletic director from Bremerton School District saw me out running and I had my wrestling shoes on and a mm -hmm. Bremerton shirt on and he stopped me and wanted kind of my bio and he said, we're looking for coaches. Hmm. And that's how it all started, really wow. by a fluke that, you know, somebody told him to, hey, we need coaches and God picked me. 
Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And before we get into kind of the trouble, if you will, that all started, tell me a little bit about your testimony. Tell me about your Christian faith, how you became a believer. It started right about 2007. I I retired from the Marine Corps and um, married my uh, childhood sweetheart. And it was just really cool how God worked that out because, I mean, we haven't talked in 30 years plus, you know, and so we we ended up together and she was a she grew up in the church. She was a you know, always the good girl and I was always a bad kid. Mm-hmm. So she invited me every Sunday without fail. Hey, would you like to go to church with us? And of course I had every excuse under the sun. Right. And one day uh, our son said, "Well, if he doesn't have to go, do I have to go?" Mm. And you know, being a parent, it's it's like, "Wow, I'm setting a bad example for him." So I Put on a nice shirt, went in there, and of course I sat there like this the whole time. Mm-hmm. Well, my wife was having a lot of problems. She was uh, abused when she was a kid, and she was in a very abusive uh, marriage uh, to the to the you know where it came. She had to run away and go to a woman's shelter. Mm. So she had a hard time dealing with um, uh, being close to somebody and letting her guard down. And I knew I wasn't getting through. So one day at church. Uh, I, I just broke down. I, I don't know where it came from. I just fell to my knees and, you know, basically exposed my soul to God and said, hey, I, I can't do this myself. If you help me with her, I'm going to give you my life. And that's the way it started. And that was about 2007. That was 2007. So you met your wife around around that time? Uh, when uh, We reconnected. I met gotcha. her when we okay. were both nine years old. Yes. And well, then tell us that story because that's a fun little story. Yeah, <laughs> why not? People love it. This is mostly women who are listening to this podcast, and so we definitely love love stories. Okay. I, it, it might sound cheesy, but... No. <laughs> um, my brother and I, we were... Uh, he, he came home from school, and I wasn't going to that school because I got kicked out of it, you can imagine, um, being in, what is that, third grade. Mm. And he came home and said, there's this new girl that lives down the road. She's so beautiful. And of course, I had to go see. Yeah. I was like, let's go talk to her. Yeah. So I walked up her driveway, and there's this little girl sitting on the front porch. And I walked right up to her, and she looked at me. And this is the cheesy part, I think, but it's it's so true. She looked up at me, and she brushed her long bangs out of her eyes. And I saw her brown eyes. And it was like slow motion, and my jaw just... <laughs> and you were nine years old nine at years this old, point. Oh, and I'm just goodness. looking at her with my mouth wide open. And she goes, can I help you? And I said, <laughs> yeah, I want to marry you. And she said, you're creepy. I'm going in the house. Yeah. <laughs> and from that moment on, well, actually, me and my brother, we, we went back to the house fighting over it. It was the first fist fight we ever got into oh, was my who was going to marry her. And I can say I won that yeah, one. Yeah, you won. And I won overall, too. <laughs> yes. Wow, that's incredible. Okay, so fast forward now. You're married to your wife, 2008. Just by God's providence, you are hired as a coach at this high school. And then when did you start praying on the field? And then when did that become a problem for some people? Okay, uh, they, they offered me a job on, on a Friday, and I said, well, give me the weekend over and be a new baby Christian. Let me pray about it and yeah. talk it over with my family. Uh, three of our kids were in, in Bremerton schools. So our daughter and our middle son, they were both at the high school. I didn't want to intrude on them. It's bad enough to have me around the house, so you can imagine what it's like having your dad at school, too. So we had a lot to talk about. And then the movie Facing the Giants came on mm. in the middle of the night, and it was an answered prayer. God, I, wow. you know, God never shows up when you want him to, but you, yeah. he does when you need him to. And I fell to my knees, and it was the answer call. And mm. in the movie, the guy said, I'm going to give you credit. You know, I'm going to give the glory after every game, win or lose. And that's where I decided to do that. I made a covenant with God right there on my living room floor. And very first football game, that's exactly what I did. It was all by myself. Um, And I just thank God. And it was something simple. Well, a couple of the kids came over months later and said, Coach, what are you doing out there? And I said, just thanking God for you guys. And they said, can we join you? Well, yeah, it's a free country. You can do whatever you want. So they started coming out, and it kind of became more and more um, it wasn't always because if you lose, sometimes kids don't want to celebrate yeah. and they sure don't want to have a moment of peace. They, you know, 
want to lick their wounds and go back onto their life. Yeah. Or sometimes if it, it was a great win, they're going crazy and want to hang out with their girlfriends and the fans and everything. So it was one of those hit and miss. If they came out, cool. If they didn't, cool. It made absolutely no difference. I would just thank God every time after after the game. Yeah. And then when did it actually become an issue that has started this whole legal battle over several years? Because it sounds like people were excited about it. It wasn't really a big deal. Um, there were just students joining. But then obviously at some point, someone got offended down the line, right? Well, it, it's interesting. It came from a compliment. In 2015, one of the administrators from another school district, they saw what we were doing and called the principal. And the principal said, or they told the principal, hey, what your football program is doing is really awesome. They saw the sportsmanship after the game where two teams came together. And of course, when you get a compliment, you want to start an investigation. And that's where it all started. They investigated it. And we worked for a long time. Uh, it, it seemed for forever to trying to work through everything. And because these guys are my friends, you know, the superintendent's a good friend of mine. We worked together for almost a decade. And I didn't want to fight with them. They didn't want to fight with me. We wanted to resolve everything as quickly as possible. But as Jeremy will tell you, they started moving the goalpost. And uh, then it goes into this huge timeline of basically it came down to me or them telling me, hey, you either stop praying or you lose your job. Mm. Can you give us a little bit more insight into what was going on behind the scenes? Why do you think they decided to make this a thing, make this a big deal? Why do you think that they decided that this was contentious and that they were going to basically take this to court? You know, it's hard to figure that out. And much of that, they're going to have to answer for themselves on that. But there seems to be this kind of reigning thought, especially within the school district right now, that if the, if religion pops up on campus, they've got to stamp it out. Mm. Almost like it's a, a virus that's going to go uh, get everybody sick of a new pandemic, if you will, and, and they've just got to stamp it out before it infects everybody. Uh, and I, I don't know that that's necessarily an intentional thing. I think it, a lot of times it's just a, they're so nervous about that because there's been so much controversy around the country, unnecessary controversy about it, that they just feel the need that I have to like just shut it down. The interesting thing in Coach's case is when they said, hey, look, you're praying with the kids, uh, that needs to stop. He said, okay, that was never my commitment to God in the first place. I'm happy to do it by myself. Mm. He stopped immediately. That was early on in September of 2015. He never prayed with the kids ever again. And it was not going to be a problem. We, we thought, honestly, when this case started, you know, maybe three weeks and this case is over. Well, here we are seven and a half years later uh, on the sixth round now of, of litigation at the Supreme Court of the United States. We're still going. Why did it extend? What happened past the three weeks that made it keep going? So coach asked, look, I'll just go back to doing my thing of, of you know, praying by myself at the 50 yard line. And they started saying a couple things. Well, number one, the uh, this is going to take away from your job responsibilities. At least that's the, the argument that they made. Because, you know, taking a knee for 15, maybe 30 seconds in silent prayer will keep him from supervising the kids, at least is what they were saying. So they said, well, is there a compromise we can come up to? Because we couldn't think of something. With it. They said, yeah. well, I'll tell you what, you can go uh, across the field, across the track, up two flights of stairs, across your practice field, inside the school building, down the hallway and into the janitor's office, and you can pray there. Well, that would take a lot more time I, and know, take away from the off. supervision. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so clearly that narrative was was not true. They, right. they said also, you know, you do you go up the press box, um, and that way nobody will see you up there. Well, that's interesting, too, because you have to set, follow the same path, except you got to go outside the stadium, back down the sidewalk, across a catwalk. Then you got to clear everybody out of the press box. And then there's these giant windows up there, too, that everybody can see. So that clearly wasn't a problem either. They just simply didn't want it on the field. And then they started saying, well, we, we recognize that, and this is their words, that your prayer was fleeting, and it was getting closer to whatever it was that they wanted. Uh, but still, they could see you. And because they could see you, the students could see him engaged in that. And he's wearing a shirt much like he's wearing right now with the Bremerton logo on it. And they know he's an authority figure. Well, that's an establishment. Of, that, that's coercion that would violate the Establishment Clause. Of, of the First Amendment. Well, that's not true, but that's the argument that they came back with here. And, we, and there was, so there was really no no more room for compromise. It was either he stop entirely, or or you know violate the Constitution according to the uh, to the school district. And so we were at an impasse. Uh, something we thought would be a very reasonable compromise. You know, you got a fifty yard line that's fifty yards wide. He could do it anywhere on there, but because they could see him engaged in demonstrative religious activity, they said. That was enough to violate the Constitution. And so now, seven and a half years later, we're still litigating that question.
Once again, I have an awesome product for you moms, and that is Annie's Kit Clubs. If you are looking for a way to keep your kids entertained while you're cooking dinner or you just need them inside, maybe it's a rainy day, but you don't just want to sit them in front of the TV, then you need to check out Annie's Kit Clubs. Whether your kids are into crafting, woodworking, or STEM projects, Annie's Kit Clubs has a membership for them. Your kids can learn new skills, express themselves, and gain confidence in critical thinking skills. With Annie's Kit Clubs, you can keep the whole family engaged and creative with hands-on monthly kits. This is is a subscription service. And so when you sign up, they send different kinds of kits and crafts to your front door every month. So there's always something new that your kids can engage in. Now is a great time to try Annie's Kit Clubs because they're offering 75% off your first shipment. All subscriptions are month to month. You can cancel at any time. Go to annieskitclubs.com slash Allie. Get your first month for 75% off. That's annieskitclubs.com slash Allie for 75% off your first month. annieskitclubs.com slash Allie. I saw an argument being made from the other side saying, you know, this isn't just about his constitutional right. This is about impressionable students and the way that he is affecting impressionable students, which is hilarious considering the conversation surrounding some legislation in places like Florida. Um, Impressionable students apparently are being coerced into, I don't know, your religious activity by seeing you pray. I guess that's the argument that's being made. What has been the, what's been the history? Why is this still going on? Um, And why are you now at the Supreme Court? What led to this? I find that argument fascinating coming from a school. Right. Because a school is is charged with teaching things. And so if they're concerned about him, you know, uh, engage in a personal activity that could be violating, well, they have the opportunity to educate the audience. And if they, if the school district can't educate the audience as to his civil rights, One's got to wonder if they can teach anything at all within the school district here. So they could have they could have put a sign up. They could have made an announcement. You know, right. they could have done any number of things to explain what was going on. Instead, they chose to fire coach for taking 15 to 30 seconds on a knee in silent prayer after the game at the 50 yeah. yard line. Uh, and, and the danger now has become that the Ninth Circuit adopted their reasoning on this whole thing. And so the the basic standard for the Ninth Circuit now is that if you're engaged in demonstrative religious activity as a, a teacher or a coach within the public schools you could be terminated from your job like Coach Kennedy has been. So what does that mean in practicality? Well, the ramifications of this are huge. If a teacher were to, for instance, say grace over her lunch in in the cafeteria, and students can see that person engaged in that demonstrative religious activity, well, that could be grounds for termination. Well, what about the teacher who wears a yarmulke or a hijab or a crucifix around their neck while teaching? All of those things are outward displays of religion. Those are private acts of worship. Part, some are, are required by their faith even. Those could be grounds for the, his term. Now, the school district will say, no, no, that's, those are different. Well, tell me how. Th- those are right. exactly the same scenarios. One happens to be you know, on a knee like you're tying your shoes, but you're praying. Uh, and so where would this will go? I mean, it, it has huge ramifications for te- teachers and coaches across the country. Think about coaches that, you know, you have a quarterback that goes down in the middle of the game and maybe they've got a torn ACL and that kid's future is just ruined right there. And the coach bows his head just a little too long. Is that going to be enough for that coach to be terminated just right. because he's engaged in demonstrative praying that this kid's future is not ruined? I right. mean, that's not the country that we've grown up in. No one should be fired from their job for you know, having to choose between their faith and their livelihood. Didn't a student group at one point invite the Seattle Satanists? to one of the games? Is that something that happened? That's somewhat true. There, there was a teacher that was involved with that. And um, I, I know the kid, what great kid. He was a student body president. And we have talked many, many times. And he thought it was going to be a big, you know, good versus evil kind of thing. And it would defuse everything. That was that was his, that was his, his plan. But the, uh, the teacher who was uh, involved in it was one of the ones that was the organizer and participated in it. And it was quite a spectacle. It was ridiculous. I was yeah. just hoping that they would actually come in and buy a ticket and maybe some hot dogs because all that money goes to our football yeah. program. Yeah. So you thought that maybe it would turn out to be something that actually benefited the school in the situation. And I would have been perfect. Kind of they could have sat right beside me. I would have been all right. Hey, maybe they would have been, if they're impressionable, maybe they would have been influenced Ooh, by your prayer. That be careful. Been, you never know. Yeah. You never know. Um, 
All right. Before I get into what you think is going to happen um, in the Supreme Court, I know that the conservative justices issued some kind of statement saying that they were concerned about your First Amendment rights. Um, I just want to hear from you personally how this has impacted your faith. I'm sure that it is not the outcome that you thought was going to come about when you took this job in 2008, even when there was that um, covenant in your words with God, where you said that you were going to live out your faith and give him glory. Surely you didn't think that it was going to be this challenging, correct? That good, good yeah. way to put it. <laughs> yes. And so just tell me kind of what it's been like for you and your family emotionally and spiritually. I would say the first, uh, probably first couple years was the worst. Um, definitely the first probably six months. Uh, I, I thought my wife and I were not going to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little known fact that she worked for the school district that, um, that we're suing. And not only did she work there, she was the HR director for the school district. Wow. So you can imagine the friction that caused. And I, I was a, you know, a new believer, and I had absolutely no way of being able to tell her why I had to do what I was doing. And it wasn't until the... Uh, so she didn't really understand uh, no no not okay. at all she thought i was you know and and of course she blames herself and she's like i'm a bad wife because i i'm mad at my husband i'm a bad christian because i'm mad at god mm -hmm. and she's mad at herself because she can't be a good employee because she would normally handle all of these mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. and it, it was just a perfect uh, storm for us and i thought we were actually we, we couldn't talk you'd come home and say hey how was your day no, nope, not that. Um, yeah. I mean, what do you talk about? Right. There's a giant, you know, not even an elephant. It's a Trinosaurus in the middle yeah. of the room. And right. it, it was so awkward. And it was great how God showed up at that. I was about ready to leave. And she was crying on the bed. I was at my wit's end because I didn't, I didn't know how to deal with any of this. And I'm hurting the person that I love the most. And I was walking out of the room and... I got a text message and I'm like, who in the heck is calling me at this time? And as I walked out, I, I clicked it and it was a video. It was the coach from um, Facing the Giants. Aww. And he, he said, I understand that you're having wow. some hard times. And let me tell you, I almost fell down the stairs. I broke our railing off and wow. my wife comes running out. Oh my goodness. And she's like, she goes, are you okay? And I, I hand her my phone and she goes, okay, well, you know, trying to help me up and I couldn't, I could, what's wrong? Yeah. And I just kept pointing to my phone and then she looked at it and she sat down and she hit play and we sat there and bawled our eyes out. Mm. And that solidified our relationship, especially with God. He, wow. he became the center of our relationship before it was always, God was always part of it right. and we were individual parts, but that totally solidified it. After that, it, it became a lot easier as far as my relationship with God and, and with my family. It made, it made it all worth it that, you know, we, were go we went through the hard time together. But it has been a long, drawn-out battle. Seven years is longer than anybody should have to, you know, go through one of these things. I thought it was going to be like law and order where something happens one day, you're in court the, the next day, and then the next day you're back doing what you love. Mm -hmm. When they said it was going to be a three-week project, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, we're in the middle of the, the football season. Yeah, We only have four games left. I can't wait three weeks yeah. to get back on the field. <laughs> so I, I really thought we could all work it out, into, you know, especially the first week. And I thought we were all on the same sheet of music. And I, tr sure? yeah, I tried to abide by everything because I, I have no hard feelings towards them. And the superintendent doesn't have any hard feelings feelings towards me it's the law i always blame the lawyers of course lawyers they make a mess out of everything yeah can't live with them can't live without them i guess <laughs> yeah i think it's illegal that to kill world. them too yeah, well. yeah. <laughs> so tell us tell us about i know you already did a little bit but tell us about the most um recent iterations and the most recent events on this timeline and what you were expecting as far as the supreme court goes yeah, and it's probably best to start with actually looking back in history because it's it's come full circle now because the school district is now arguing, and, and this is clearly the, the attorneys that they've adopted for the appeal that are making this argument, that he was coercing kids into prayer. Well, that, that's demonstrably false. I yeah. mean, if you go to CoachKennedyFact.com, you can read these for yourselves. Uh, on October 21st, so this is a week before he's suspended, the superintendent sends an email to the head director of schools in the state of Washington. And in that email, he says, this has changed from, this case has shifted from becoming a, a case about a coach praying with the athletes to a coach praying by himself at the 50-yard line. Mm. 
Uh, five days later, he would take his last knee after the JV game at uh, on October 26th. Um, two days later, he's suspended. And on the day they suspend him, they put a Q&A out on the website. And they said, you know, we've done this whole investigation. There is indeed no evidence that any student was coerced into praying with the coach right. at all. And yet they continue to maintain to the Supreme Court that he's engaged in, in coercing these students. Their, their hashtag is pray to play, which is just simply false. This is Number one, he didn't have any time. He didn't control. It makes his my eye twitch. <laughs> I know. So well, I mean, I know it's speculation, and maybe you can't say. But is it just? Do you think it's ideological for them? Their motivations? What's in it for them? Well, I, I think the school district has pure motives. They're just trying to figure it out. Yeah, but I but do as think for the attorneys, the attorneys, I think, may have a different agenda on things. And and I I I I don't like to cast aspersions too much on what that may be. But their arguments here just defy reality, if that makes some sense. And so I think the Supreme Court's going to, the Supreme Court's no fools. I mean, they, they've got good justices, their clerks are top notch. They're going to look into the record, and the record is very clear how Coach stopped praying with the kids when he was asked to stop praying with the kids. And they refuse to allow him to continue the practice of just by himself for 15 to 30 seconds, taking a knee in private prayer at the 50 yard line. There should be no major concern about that whatsoever in this nation that values the free exercise of religion. And yet they've denied that to him time and time again, even though they said it was, quote, fleeting that he was engaged in that kind of activity. Uh, and so to deny him that entirely and to make him choose between his, his, the job that he loves uh, and, and, uh, and his faith, well, that no American should have to make that decision. Right. I, I hope, and again, it's a bit of a fool's errand to try to handicap the Supreme Court of the United States, but I would hope that the justices, even the liberal ones, would understand that important principle. Because what happens to Coach Kennedy, look, at the end of the day, I just want him back on the field with his kids. And if that's the only decision, great. But if it goes beyond that, if the standard is that if you engage in any kind of religion in the public square, your employer can fire you. Right. Well, the promise of the First Amendment is all but dead. All right, this last sponsor is near and dear to my heart, and that is preborn. You guys know the leading cause of death in the world is actually abortion. 63 million children have been aborted since Roe v. Wade. That is a huge number. And we just have to do everything that we can to save those babies' lives. And that means not just encouraging mothers to choose life for their babies, but also helping them however we can after those babies are born. And that is what pre-born does. It is a ministry that's a direct competition to Planned Parenthood. It provides free sonograms for women. And also when a mother chooses life, they provide maternity and baby clothes, diapers, car seats, counseling, and much more free of charge. And Preborn is partnering with Blaze Media right now to help rescue 50,000 babies from abortion in 2022. And we are already well on our way, thanks to you. We are calling them Blaze Babies, and we are just so happy to help and partner with an organization that is doing such great Christ-centered work for these women and children. Over the past 15 years, pre-born centers have counseled over 450,000 women considering abortion. 188,000 babies have been saved. So do your part. Join in this partnership to save these babies' lives and help these women who are pregnant with these babies. Donate by dialing pound 250 and say keyword baby. That's pound 250 and uh, type key Keyword baby, or go to preborn.com slash alley. That's preborn.com slash alley. And it seems to me, from my perspective, that Christians are held to a higher standard. You mentioned if someone is wearing a hijab, if someone is wearing any kind of outward expression of their faith, is that going to be considered an act of worship that is a fireable offense? It does it seem that that is the standard that's applied across the board? It seems like there seems to be a, a higher standard for Christians engaging in prayer. Maybe that's my personal well, it's bias. Interesting you say that, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's the one of the judges in the Ninth Circuit wrote this entire opinion, and it was it was it was an unfortunate narration. Let's put it that way. But at the yeah. very end of it, after criticizing him for his free exercise rights and even for talking to the media, which I thought was kind of interesting. He kind of commits the First Amendment trifecta, violates the Establishment Clause, violates the Free Speech Clause, and violates the people, you know, the, the uh, freedom of the press, all in the same act. So it was yeah, kind of I'm crazy. horrible because I'm talking to you. Yeah. But, but if, if being a bad citizen is not bad enough, according to this judge, at the very end of it, he says, you know, as I read the Bible, we're not supposed to go out in public and pray. We're supposed to go into our prayer closet. 
Now think about that for a second. This is a federal circuit judge right. that is basically declaring that Coach is a bad Christian. Well, that actually is an establishment clause violation. That is actually telling him how he should or should not behave according to his religious beliefs. Uh, and yet the, the, the irony is lost entirely upon the other side that right. a federal circuit judge would declare him basically to be a bad Christian. He knows right. that by himself. Uh, trying to love God and love others, we fail at that every day. And But I mean, we don't need a federal judge to tell you that you're a bad Christian or not. Right. That has no bearing, should have no bearing. And of course, that is theologically misleading because <laughs> the point of that passage is not really about where we are praying, but the posture of our heart when we're praying. It's, it's about, you know, Pharisees wanting the glory, which is not why you were praying. You weren't praying to be seen. You weren't praying to be celebrated. You were praying because that is what Christians do. Yeah. That's where we're called to and, and being pray without thankful. I, I, yeah, yeah. I think that's in the Bible somewhere. Yeah, I think yeah. so too. And so, you know, it reminds me so much of uh, what the lawyers argued in Jack Phillips's case when they compared him to when they compared his actions to uh, Genghis Khan and yes, all the rest. racism yeah. and Nazism and discrimination against people they're making these theological moral statements beyond legal statements which really does reveal kind of an ideological motivation which I think is really frightening and again should be frightening for people no matter their political affiliation no matter their religious affiliation when you think about the possible implications of that for people's expression of religion or lack of expression of um, religion. So what do you what do you anticipate is going to happen? When do you anticipate this decision? So we're going to have the argument on April 25th uh, at the Supreme Soon. Court of the United States that's coming right up. And then by the end of June, we should have a decision. Wow. Uh, you know, there's a case back in the 1960s, very famous case called Tinker v. Des Moines. It's the mm -hmm. student armband case protesting the Vietnam War. And the court said that it's been the unmistakable holding on that court for well over 60 years that neither students nor teachers must shed their constitutional rights when they walk through the schoolhouse gates. That case dealt with students. And so we know that students don't have to shed their constitutional rights when they go through the schoolhouse gates. This case really could answer the second part of that, which really never has been well answered by the court. Must teachers, must coaches shed their constitutional rights when they go through the schoolhouse gates? How many of them must they shed? In what way do they have to shed them? Uh, do, does the state own all of Coach Kennedy's speech just because he wears a Bremerton Knights t-shirt or right. a polo shirt? Right. So if he's at Cracker Barrel and he says grace over his meal and the student is sitting across the way and sees that, is that an exception yeah. clause violation? Right. I should hardly think so. But we're going to find out just how many constitutional rights our public employees have when they walk through the schoolhouse gates by this case. Yeah. And what is your your prayer, your hope, your thought process right now? Oh, it's been what it is from the beginning that that I just want to coach high school football, you yeah. know, and I want to be able to thank God afterwards. I mean, I, to me, it's not a big ask. And right. it seems weird it's going to Supreme Court just to ask to do something so simple and has been part of my life for, you know, decades. So, yeah, hopefully yeah. We, we'll have a win and I'm um, putting my faith in, in God. He's yeah. got all this and uh, the justice system that, uh, you know, the Supreme Court will actually rule on the facts instead of uh, their own made-up stories. Mm. And in addition to praying, is there anything my audience can do to offer support, to help? Yeah, they can go to firstliberty.org. They can actually send a note of, of uh, support to Coach Kennedy through that website. He, he reads those. He loves those Good. when they get those, those things come through. But also, I mean, go to coachkennedyfacts.com, which is a part of our website anyway. But uh, tell the story to everybody else around you. Share the share the videos that are on that page that mm -hmm. tells his whole story. Coach has a very fascinating story that we've just barely scratched the surface of. Yeah. I mean, adopted kid, kind of goes into foster care through most of his life, starts living on his own at the age of 15, goes in the Marine Corps, serves our country, which is probably the most painful irony here is that here he fought for the freedoms that he's been denied. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just, it's just terrible. So firstliberty.org, coachkennedyfacts.com will get you more information about Coach. But actually, you are fighting for our freedoms now in a different way. Yeah. And so it's not necessarily on the same front lines that you were before, but by simply expressing your faith in a way that was obedient to God, you are still to this day fighting for the freedoms that you fought for when you were actually a service member. So thank you for that. Thank you for your thank courage. You. I know it's not a battle that you meant to engage in, but you did for such a time as this. And I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for what you guys do as well. Um, gosh, we need, we need, I know lawyers, they can be a pain, but we need good ones, right? Two yeah. against one here now. Yeah, that, <laughs> that fight for freedom. So thank you guys so much. And I do encourage people. My audience is a 
very encouraging, supportive audience. So I know that you're going to get a ton of messages, awesome. kind messages from them and prayers. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to come on. Thank, Thank you, you so much.